Good morning. I am very happy that you have been able to join us this morning at Creator Episcopal Church in Mechanicsville, Virginia on this rainy day. We are inside once again because the weather is, is keeping us from meeting on the portico, but it is a joy to be back in the church if we can't even, if it is that we can't be together uh, outside. So I am just very happy that you are here with us. We're going to begin the service in just a moment with the lighting of the candles on the altar. These candles are a symbol to us that we light. Symbolically, we are lighting one candle, the light that we that uh, is kindled within us as we accept the gift of the Holy Spirit anew each moment, each moment that we can, that we think about the presence of God in our lives and, and, and take this on again, and lighting the second candle, the light of Christ, that God's light through our Lord Jesus Christ burns in the world and lights the world, a fire, a blaze with the power of the Holy Spirit. So we'll begin the service as we do that. We're on page 355 in the Book of Common Prayer. This is the Holy Service of Holy Eucharist Rite Two. Of course, we won't be doing the Eucharist today, but we will begin with the service of the Word, and then I will give you page instructions at the end of the service if you have the bulletin uh, where we'll jump over the Eucharist and, and we'll finish the service together if you have a prayer book with you on page 102 with the prayer of St. Chrysostom. And I will remind you of that when we get to that point, so don't worry. But if you have a, a prayer book handy, uh, grab it. And if you don't and you want to look it up online, you can do that. Uh, and we'll say that prayer together if you are able. So for a dive into the presence of our Lord together, let us begin. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Lord God, we thank you for the beauty of this day, for the wonder of life, for your faithfulness and your desire to call us together at this time that we might inwardly digest and grow in your word and through your spirit. We ask you to open our hearts and minds and spirits to lift us in heart and mind and spirit to your presence that we might continue to grow and to blossom, to receive the gifts that you have given to us, that we might relinquish more and more of our lives to you and thereby receive more and more of the grace that you shower upon us. We pray all this in your son's name, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We'll begin with Verses 1 and 2 of hymn 362. Son and Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. 
Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command. This through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from Leviticus, chapter 19. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice, you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is Psalm 1. We can read it together in unison. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. The second reading today is from the first book of Peter. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Christ Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, 
ask Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Now, no one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the gospel for today takes us immediately down this wonderful pathway, this road, that delivers us to a gift. Now, as I've said before, and I will say for the rest of my life, the gift of Scripture, in part, is the continuity of the witness and the person of God visiting the presence of God on the people of God throughout time, so that we can look back through the Scripture and we find with assurance that God was present, present very specifically in some moments, but present by direction and by will in others. And that there is a gift, a gift that is given to you and to me and to all people, God's gift of many gifts that we are, are at liberty to receive and to receive anew time after time after time. It is literally the gift that keeps on giving. So, so what's happening in the gospel today? The Pharisees have gotten together and heard that Jesus had shut down the Sadducees. This is at a period in time in the gospel when we hear that the, the, the teachers of the law, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the elders, the, the temple scribes have come to Jesus in succession somewhat, and they are asking Jesus questions. They are asking him questions that are going to push Jesus to a point. And now there are two reasons why we turn to God and seek out this continuity in scripture. One is a very proactive and positive event, and the other one, not so much. So. One is the reason why you're here, and the reason why I'm here, and the reason why Christians and people of good faith gather all around the world on this day and on other days to worship our Lord. And that is because with the, with the worship, with the listening and the reciting, with the singing and the hearing, with the reflection and the prayer, we are inviting into ourselves a change, inviting into ourselves a conversion or a transition from a position of focus on ourselves to a focus on God. Sometimes this is very subtle. Chances are we don't even notice we're doing it. In those times, while it may be comforting, it's also dangerous because it can be so subtle that it's easy for us to, to shoo off or to walk away from or simply to not realize that all it's happening and go on to something else. What we really want in our lives is a more robust uh, calling forth a witness of God, like a burning bush or a talking donkey or an angel on the road. That's what we want. And we, we have a tendency to look outside of ourselves for those things to happen rather than looking inside of ourselves to make those things happen. Now, can I make a donkey talk or an angel walk on the road? Of course not. But there are other methods through which God acts in us and you that can make those events possible for others. It's a strange thing that God acting in me is for someone else. 
God acting in me for the other. So we come together in church, we come together in prayer, we come together in Bible study, we come together in the private moments where we ourselves are expending energy and time to find the way that mixes, that matches, that, that, that melds with us, that we can grow in heart and mind and spirit into a deeper understanding and relationship with God through the Holy Spirit in our Lord Jesus Christ. And why do we do it? That's the question. Why? Why do we do it? We do it for all the reasons I've already stated, so that we might grow and become more and receive more, because God's promises to us are amazing. Grace and love and prosperity and companionship and peace and companionship and companionship and companionship. You know, when we have this feeling of the presence of God, we're never alone. You can't ever be alone again. You can't find yourself at the bedside of someone who is sick or in the waiting room down the hall. You can't find yourself lost on the road somewhere or at night in your own home alone. You cannot find yourself there alone. Growing deeper into the presence of Christ, we find that Christ is with us, helping us, directing us, and accompanying us along the way. That's part of the gift. It's a great part of the gift. So we do this to receive more of the gift that we've already been given. But there is another reason for doing this, and it's not so savory. It's not so good at all. In fact, it's what's happening and has happened in Scripture and the witness of Scripture to us. We hear it happening today. The, sad, the Pharisees have heard that Jesus shut down the Sadducees, and so they've taken this opportunity to go and talk to him. And it says, then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, and we, we say, but why? Why would they ask him a question? Well, we have the answer right away to test him. Now, you can be tested, and I can be tested. I'm tested all the time. I'm sure that you're tested now and then, maybe actually more than you think. We can be pro tested professionally or tested within the context of our relationships. We can be tested unconsciously or very proactively. Students, I was talking to Will the other day, they get tested at school. They learn something, and they receive a test. It's a it's a, it's a completely impersonal event simply put forth by the teacher or the academic board to find out if you have read and learned the things that they've told you to read. Why? Because that information is going to come in handy later on. That's all good. That's one kind of test. There's another kind of test. There's a test that comes to you to see if you are proficient in what you are doing so that you may be promoted in your workspace. There's another kind of test, a test that happens within the context of our own lives. We test ourselves to see if we are staying abreast of what's happening. I was talking to my dentist not too long ago and to a doctor just out of, out of, out of course, who said that they regularly go to the, the, the medical journals that, of the profession that they are in because they have to stay up on the latest thing. And when you go to the doctor, you say, well, I hope he knows what he's doing. I hope she knows what she's doing. Well, don't we all hope that? But the doctor, we don't ask the doctors. When was the last time you asked a doctor or a dentist? When was the, the doctor or the dentist? When was the last time you read a medical journal or studied up on the latest stuff? If they are a doctor or a dentist who are taking their, their vocation and their, and their calling seriously, then they're doing that all the time. Testing themselves and then rising above. The test we find in scripture is neither of these. This test is, is the lawyer testing Jesus to make him fail, to find something in what he's going to say that they can use against him. They're asking him here about the Ten Commandments. Ask him a question, teacher, which commandment and the law is, uh, is the greatest? They want him to pick one of the ten and hold that one up higher than the other so that they can then ridicule him and tear him down, to discredit him for choosing that particular commandment. You know, we find this problem in our own lives in the church and have since the church began, long before Jesus came, in Judaism long before that, that we take one passage or one principle of scripture, usually something that means a lot to us because that's just the way we beat, that we hold this one thing up above all the other parts of scripture and the light from this one then colors and illuminates everything else below it. And you see the problem, don't you? The light from this one is going to cast shadows on other parts of Scripture and other points of Scripture, Scriptures that we don't like, Scripture we don't agree with, Scripture we don't understand, and we're going to let all of that go because of this one, the one that we've held up high, the one that we've put up at the top of the level, which defines all other Scriptures. But as I said before, Scripture is a continuity of the witness of God. 
Scripture is a continuity of the will of God and the presence of God manifest and given out to the people of God. All passages, all parts of Scripture have to be held up in communion with all others. To fully and truly understand what this passage means, I cannot put it on a pedestal up here. I have to hold it in tension with this one. And only then will I be able to make some sense of it. You see how old this is. They were trying to get Jesus to do this very thing, to hold up a passage of Scripture by which they could then ridicule him or tear him down because they had the other one to hold up, to fight him with it. Oh, yes, you say it's this one, but look at this one. Does this sound familiar? Jesus and typical Jesus passion and wisdom does not bite on this. And he goes someplace else. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And you know where he gets that? He gets it out of the book of Deuteronomy 6.5. He goes back to someplace other than Exodus to the Ten Commandments, to someplace else again. And he takes this passage. And every Jew that was there listening to this, every Hebrew person listening to this, would be immediately sucked into this passage of Scripture because this whole block of Scriptures means so much in, in the history of the, of the Jewish people and in our history. Even today, this block of, of scripture from four to 10 form a huge foundational block of the belief of the Jewish faith. It begins like this in verse four, which we don't have. Hear, O Israel, hear, O Israel, right? Shema Yisrael. This is hear, O Israel. And we shorten that and we call it the Shema because what follows after this hero Israel is the Lord our God is one. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. If we have a nice scene in Apostles' Creed, the Jewish faith, the closest thing they have is the Shema, hero Israel. It is the Shema that, can, that, can, that uh, the high priest used to condemn Jesus in the, in the trial. Remember Jesus came and he was, he was being witnessed against and finally, the high priest said to him, are you God? And he said, I am, which is Yahweh, which is the name of God. And the high priest tore his prayer shawl because it made God too. The Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. One. This begins at the second verse after this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. So you have this, this shame of the statement, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. The one God. You shall love the God with all you have. And then continues past that passage that, he's, that Jesus is quoting, the fifth verse of Deuteronomy today, continues with this. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them. You ready? When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. In effect, what is he saying? When will you contemplate, reflect, and talk about these things? Everywhere. Always. With everyone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength and everything that you have, and you shall do this when and where, everywhere, all the time. And you shall teach this to your children and your children's 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 children because these are the words of life, because this is the passage that lifts us up. This is the passage that changes us from solitaries, from alone, from bereft, from fearful into people who are constantly and forever in companionship with God. It doesn't stop there. Hang on. Verse 8. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as a frontlets between your eyes. We call them in, in, incorrectly. This is referred to as phylacteries. We've said that for so long. I've even said it. Phylacteries is a Greek word that means amulet. So when the Greeks saw the Jews doing this weird thing that they did, they said, what are they doing? They said, well, they're putting something on their arm here and something on their forehead right here. And the Greeks said, oh, they're, they're amulets. They're putting amulets on. They're called phylacteries. They're not actually called phylacteries. In the Jewish faith, they're called teflon. And, and the teflon 
is a, is a box with a parchment inside of it, here and here, and you'll see it in pictures. You sometimes see they have a, a, bi a binding of their arm around their arm here, and, and the straps from their head go down their front. They're binding themselves in the Lord for their prayers. It's a prayer routine. We, talk, we were talking in the, in the Bible study or in the book study the other day about prayer beads and different types of prayer beads and tools. This is a tool, but it's a tool based exactly on the scripture. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you shall bind them as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall wear these things in your prayers. And, and this is what they're doing. So again, all the minds of the Jews are going right to the scripture, and it ends with this one for today, which you're aware of. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house. You remember, you've seen that? You've gone to a, a, some of Jewish faith, and they've got that, that thing nailed to the, to the door jam right there, and you, they go by. If you watch them, they'll put their hand on they'll kiss it. It's a mezuzah. What is in that? What does it say? Hear, O Israel. God, our God, is one. So this passage of Scripture is at the heart of the Jewish faith, and Jesus goes right to it to quote it back to the Jews. They would know exactly what he was saying. They would be ready spiritually in this moment because these are practices that they have been doing for thousands of years. And Jesus says, well, the, but you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. This is the greatest commandment. All of the Ten Commandments are defined somehow by this one. And then he says, and the second is like in it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Where did he get that? We got that in our first verse, our first scripture for today. It comes out of the book of Leviticus. See, he goes someplace else. He said, speak to the, all the congregations of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And then continues on, you shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall not reprove. You shall not take vengeance. And then but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You know, this, this passage of scripture was hotly thought about and debated back in Jesus' day and has spent a lot of theological ink on this as well until this day. And here is one view, one prominent view of understanding this passage of loving your neighbor as yourself connected to this passage about you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And this is what it is. You ready? Loving my neighbor as myself is the outward and visible sign of the depth that I have in love for God. God loves us so much that God gave himself even unto death on a cross so that we might not die, that we would live. God loved us so much that God gave himself up for us that we might live. I love God so much that I'm willing to give myself up for the other that they might live. You see how it's connected? You see how tightly these are connected? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and be like him. Remember St. Paul says, be like Christ. Become like Christ. Grow into Christ. Use me as an example, he says. I'm trying. Look at me. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm failing. I'm failing. But I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to be like Christ. Look at me as the example of one who's trying and failing. Don't be too hard on yourself. To grow into and be in the likeness of Christ. And what did Christ do? What did Jesus do? He loved so much that he gave himself up even to death on a cross for the other. Who did he die for? Everyone. Not just his mother and James at the foot of the cross, not just his disciples who loved him and wept and hid in the room for fear, but he died for the Roman soldier who drove the nails. He died for the Roman soldier who threw the spear. He died for those who chided him and beat him on the way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul, for God loves us with all God's heart and mind and spirit. And then love the other, love the other as you love yourself. Now you see how important this is? This is where Jesus is taking the Pharisees. He's taking them to this place where he's saying, I know why you asked me the question. You asked me to test me. But, but you've made your God too small. You've made your Messiah too small. You think the Messiah is this little tiny thing, this little tiny defined thing, defined by Moses, defined by David. Both David and Moses were Old Testament Messiahs. 
They want to look for a Messiah that looks like them. And Jesus is saying, no. No, this is why you're studying scripture. This is why you're coming together to learn and to grow and to sing and to recite. This is why you're coming together to pray. You're not coming together to say all these things, to affirm all these things in you and make you feel like, oh yeah, I got it right. I got the right answer. That's not it. That's not the question. The question why is answered by, so that I can grow beyond me, grow beyond this knowledge, grow beyond this dependence on what makes me happy, grow into a bigger, better understanding of who God truly is, and allow God to expand and explode God's own presence in my life, to love God with all my heart and my soul and my mind, and then and only then will I be capable of loving my neighbor as myself, to give up myself for the other one, it's a tough journey. It's a hard thing to do. As Paul told us, as we show ourselves and show each other, we fail all the time. But you know, the wonderful thing about God is that even though we fail, God still loves us, still cares about us, still seeks us, forgives us, holds us, and lifts us back up. And every time you can hear God's whisper, listen, listen, listen. Now, this is continuing because Jesus says, as the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus took the opportunity. Let me ask you a question, he says. What, what do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? You see, he's going back to this place. You've asked me the question for the wrong reason. Now, let me ask you a question to help you grow beyond this thing that you are entombing in yourself. And they said, the son of David, because that's what the scripture says. And Jesus said, you're right. That's great. You've got, you've got Messiah 101 down because you heard it in the scripture. But how about the next thing? How about this other thing? How is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls him, that's the Messiah, Lord, saying, the Lord has said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Where did he get this from? He was going to Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make the, your enemies my, my enemies your footstool. And this is a reflective of Psalm 100, if we go back there, where he says, know this, the Lord himself is God. He made, it, he made us and we are his. So how is it that David, the king, the progenitor, calls his son his Lord? Now, you and I can do this. You and I even have maybe examples in our history about this, where we have members of our families in the old country that may have been dukes or earls or something, and so a, a daughter or a son or, uh, rising up to a position, their parents can then call them Lord as a... As a uh, uh, an academic or a royal title, but not so with David. In the time of David, it would have been unheard of for the son to be called a greater title than the father. And this is why it makes that point with the Jews that are listening. How is it that he calls him Lord? And not only, not only Lord in the human sense, but Lord in the divine sense. How does that happen? No one was able to give him an answer. Why was that? because they were looking through that limited perspective again. They weren't gathering as we are gathered to listen in prayer and supplication and reflection and open our hearts and minds to God that we might grow. They were listening through, I just want to hear what I want to hear. I just want to see what I want to see. And Jesus, as Jesus is doing, trying to save them, saying, don't do that anymore. Don't do that. Open that up. It's hard, maybe not all the way. Maybe just open a little bit like this, just like that. Just let some divine light in there and see what happens. See if you don't grow and change. See if you don't become something more. I want to think, as I've said before, and that some of the Pharisees went away from this point, realizing that he spoke the truth, that they, he was right, and something burned. Remember the road to Damascus? That when he spoke about this, something burned within them. And I want to think that some of these Pharisees were the ones who were at the foot of the cross with Mary and James, not because they were condemning him, but because they were finally seeing with their spirit what they couldn't see prior with their eyes. I want to think that they actually heard and, and understood, at least some. But I know that there were others who didn't and wouldn't and couldn't allow themselves to grow in depth and relationship with Christ because they couldn't allow God to be more than the God that they had fashioned. Still, God does not give up, never gives up, won't give up. He keeps coming back over and over again. And that lessons from that first 
first uh, lesson for the day from the book of Leviticus again. We hear about this thing. We have this comment we often talk about. Should we judge one another? And here we find it right there. With justice, you shall judge your neighbor. How is that possible? I thought we were supposed to judge. Hang on. You shall not go around slandering among your people. You shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Who says this? God says this. You shall not hate in your heart any of your kin. But how about this one? You shall reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt yourself. Do you understand what he's saying here? We don't use this word reprove very much. It's an ancient word, say archaic in our language, basically right now. Maybe we'll re 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 bring it back one day. What he's saying is that when you come across somebody who has got the wrong, going the wrong way, has got the wrong logic, has got the wrong understanding, has, has gone off to the reservation, because you, because you have studied and have learned and are coming before God in supplication, have opened your heart and mind and spirit, and you have a confidence in what you believe God is saying, you are to correct the other person. Correct this person for what they're saying. Correct this person for what they're doing. Reprove them. Reprove the message to them. Not because you hate them. Not because you want them to burn. Not because they're terrible people. I think about our political thing going on right now. It breaks my heart. Not because these people are awful, horrible people, but because you're following the will of God, turning this moment over to God, and you are finding peace and consolation in this moment for in yourself as you reprove them so that when you walk away, you don't bear the burden. You don't fill up with hate or discord over it, you walk away in prayer for them that they might find in your words some witness of the presence of God. And like hopefully some of those Pharisees, maybe not right now, but maybe in an hour or a day, find a new light brighter than the one that they have been following. You should not take vengeance or bear a grudge you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The only way to do this, the only way is to love God. To love God with all of your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. Only when we love God this way can we love our neighbor as ourselves. I've got one more thing for you. I'm going to throw up the cover of the bulletin for today and show you this cover. If you've got it, download it. I, I have seen so many uh, GIF images and pictures of this line, Be holy, for I am holy. Most of them were, were beautiful calligraphy on top of beautiful pictures of the sun shining through the haze or across the water or the sunset. You know, the image of the beauty and wonder and miracle of, of creation that God had created. And then this beautiful line, be holy for I am holy, inspired by God. But this one jumped out at me. Do You see the difference right away, don't you? Loving God, being holy like God is holy, doesn't happen on the, on the, on the side of a lake in the beautiful sunset with the, with the colors in the sky or on the ocean with the birds flying and the gulls squealing or on some mountain lake or stream or, or some quiet place. Being holy as God is holy, like this person standing, takes place within the context of the life that we live, on the street, with our feet on the asphalt, with the buildings all around us, and in the dark. Because that's the world. The world is the dark place, the place of division and corruption and brokenness and screaming and occupations. God has always said this is the way it's going to be. And that's why I need people like you. That's why I send you out into the world to make a difference. And so this person stands there and the light shines and pierces the darkness and illumines that person and not only that person, but the world around them just a bit. Okay. The second lesson, Peter talks about this line. He uses it at the very end of his passage. He says... But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy, all of you, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. He is quoting this book of Leviticus. You shall be holy, for I, your God, am holy. The difference is this word shall. Be holy may be understood as a choice. 
Well, maybe I'll be holy today. Maybe I'll be holy once I've studied enough. But that's not what God said back in Leviticus. God said, if you love me, if you try to love me with your heart and your mind and your soul, you shall be holy. I shall make you holy. I shall be the light that shines in the darkness for you. I shall be the companion on the lonely road. I shall be the peace that passes all understanding. I shall be the one that lifts you when you think you cannot stand. And you can't, but you are not alone. The wonderful thing about God is that God makes us holy so that we might give that holiness to others, that we might shine that light of Christ into the world for those who cannot see, those who do not know. And in so doing, we receive that gift I talked about at the very beginning, part of that bigger gift, that, that wonderful gift that never stops giving because it's God's love to correct all these things in our lives, to replace those things, you know those things, Replace them with the love and the companionship and the light of Christ. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And you shall be holy. For I, your God, am holy. Amen. Service will continue on page 358. Let us say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified, he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and for those of others. Gracious and loving Lord God, we again give you thanks and praise that you have brought us together at this time. 
that you have called us each by name and you offer to us again because of your great faithfulness, the gifts of light and love and companionship and joy and wonder and prosperity in your presence. We pray and hold up this day, Lord, all members of our parish family and extended family and ask your blessing upon them, your relief for their distress and healing for their infirmities. We pray for our extended family and for those who are known to us individually, whom we now name either aloud or in our hearts. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to comfort and bring those peace who are in need. We ask your presence to be made known to them, that they might grow in the likeness of our Lord Jesus, that they might know his companionship along the way. We pray this for ourselves and our pain and our distance, that you would enter and continue to grow in us, that we might depend ever more upon you and find this gift of your presence to renew us and change our lives. We pray for the youth of our parish family and for youth everywhere who are struggling under the odd rhythm of being with COVID-19. We ask you to give them wisdom and peace and hope in the future. We pray for all those who are suffering from the loss, the death of a loved one, especially those who died from COVID-19, bring them peace. Help them by being their companion along the way. We pray for our president and we pray for the vice president, former vice president, as they approach this day of election. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for peace, consolation, for fellowship, for good manners and maturity among our citizenry. We pray for your presence. Gracious, gracious God, it is a privilege to pray and to be assured of your presence in our hearts and minds and spirits. We ask you to manifest the answers to our prayers in our lives that we might tangibly know you and rely ever more upon you, that we might grow ever more in your likeness and in your love, that we might be holy. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name, amen. Service continues on page 360. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most, Most merciful God, God we, we confess, confess that, that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we, and we humbly, humbly repent. repent. For the, the sake of your Son, Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and, and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Our service will continue on page 102. You can stay there. In the Book of Common Prayer, we will say together the prayer of St. Chrysostom. Page 102. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in, in the, the age, age to come, come life, life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. For the fruit of all creation, thanks be to God. For his gifts to every nation, thanks be to God. For the plowing, sowing, reaping, silent growth while we are sleeping, future needs in earth safe keeping, thanks be to God. In the just reward of labor, God's will be done. In the help we give our neighbor, God's will be done. In our worldwide task of caring for the hungry and despairing, in the harvest we are sharing, God's will be done. Alleluia, alleluia, let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. God bless you all. Thank you so much. I pray you have a wonderful and prosperous and joyful day.